When we left Augustine, he was traveling back from Italy to North Africa after his mother Monica died to start a monastery. And that's exactly what he did. But he didn't get to live in his monastery very long. After a fairly short time, he visited the town of Hippo to invite a friend who lived there to join his monastery. And while in Hippo, he went to church. And the bishop, whose name was Valerius, saw him in, the, in church and preached a sermon about how God sends shepherds to tend his flock and told the congregation to pray for God's guidance in case there was anyone in the church whom God had sent to be their pastor. This had precisely the effect he wanted and the congregation decided that obviously God had sent Augustine to be their pastor and they called him and he was not happy about it because he wanted to be a monk, not a pastor. But now he didn't have a choice. So he was ordained and about four years later, uh, Valerius, um, got him elected bishop along with Valerius, so two of them at the same time, which was technically not allowed, but they didn't know that. Uh, neither of them was aware of that rule at the time. And uh, the reason Valerius did this was because he was afraid Augustine would go, pastor, go be pastor somewhere else. And there was a rule that they both did know about, saying that once you were a bishop, you couldn't leave the city where you were a bishop. You couldn't go be bishop somewhere else. Not that you couldn't travel, but you had to stay bishop of that city. Now, you may have noticed that I've not written or drawn anything about this. That's because the important thing in all this is because is that Augustine became Bishop of Hippo. Um, Valerius was rather old at the time that he did all this to Augustine and he died shortly after Augustine became bishop. Why do we care? Well, partly it's to tell him apart from some later Augustines, but who were named after him. This pushed him into all the disputes of his age. He had wanted to live in his monastery, studying the scriptures, contemplating theology and writing theological books, which he ended up doing, but he was forced by being bishop to write specifically about the, the theological disputes that were going on. Here's what I want you to look for in this lesson. What are, not were, are, his greatest books. And what are they about? I expect this to use up all of your notes. If you just send me two or three notes, I will send it back and say, no, you didn't try hard enough. There is more to put in. So what are his greatest books and what are they about? These sound like simple questions, but they're not. Be careful that you don't use up all your line of notes right at the beginning of the lesson. I've seen some of you do that and then you don't have enough for the important things that come at the end. If you find that happening, you're gonna to have to change your notes and get rid of some of the earlier ones. You are warned. Now, Augustine did an awful lot of writing in his life, which is what makes him, one of the things that make him the most influential theologian of the Western church. He wrote against all the heresies of his age. He wrote against the Manichees. 
Remember, he had been a Manichae, and he had led some other people to be Manichae. Uh, by the way, this is just another different name for the Manichaeans, same people. We just say it two different ways. He had been one of these and led some other people to be, to join them. And he regretted that, so he considered it his duty to oppose them as much as he could. He wrote against the Donatists. He was in North Africa. He didn't really have, he couldn't avoid writing against the Donatists. He wrote against, he wrote a lot against the Pelagians. Do you remember all the things that I told you the church taught against Pelagius? Well, Augustine was one of the few people to write most of those down. In fact, of all the faithful pastors and bishops who opposed Pelagius, Augustine did most of the writing. And against the semi-Pelagians, He even wrote a little bit against the Arians, although they had already been kicked out of the empire and weren't such a visible problem anymore as they had been. They were still a big problem outside the empire among the, the Goths and the Vandals and all the Germanic peoples who were invading the empire. But within the empire, they had kind of faded out of everybody's sight, mostly. But he did do some writing against them. He also, wrote a great many letters to other pastors and bishops and uh, people who were not pastors and bishops. But one of the people to whom he wrote and who wrote to him was a monk from, I think, Italy. I might be mistaken about that, but a monk named Jerome. Jerome was at this time that he was writing back and forth to Augustine. Jerome was translating the Bible from Greek and Hebrew into Latin. We call this the Vulgate because that's the dialect of Latin. It was written and he didn't use, he wrote it in the kind of Latin used by common people, not the classical Latin that we're learning, such as was used by um, scholars and literary people. He wrote it, he, he didn't write it, he translated it into the common version of Latin that everyone would understand because he wanted everyone to be able to read the Bible. Now, this would, there would be some problems surrounding this in later centuries, and he did make a few mistakes, which would also cause problems, but that's much later on, and we're not talking about that this year. Um, one of the many books that Augustine wrote was um, a series of basically philosophical lessons for his son. But that's not one of the two that we're concerned with today. Of all his books, the two most important are his confessions and the city of God. And both of these are about God's work in creation, God's work in history. The confessions are about God's work in the life of a Christian. One person, specifically Augustine, but he didn't mean this just to be a record of his own conversion, his own life and conversion. He meant it to be an example of God's work in the life of a Christian. And his, his life was the life of a Christian that he was going to, was going to use.
Everything I've read says that there is no other book like this in the entire world. No other book like this one has ever been written. The Confessions is a book that, an autobiography is when someone writes the story of their own life. This is a spiritual autobiography. It is about the work of God in Augustine's life. And it is written, the whole book is written as a prayer of thanksgiving. For the felt for, um, the forgiveness of sins, for conversion, and for the gifts that God gave to Augustine as a Christian. It goes through his whole life from, as you may recall from our last lesson, um, it starts with Augustine's life as, well, as a child, really, and his studying in Carthage. And he talks about himself as a slave of his sinful passions, of his evil desires. Remember that he was not married to his son's mother, that sort of thing. So it starts with this. And then he goes on to talk about becoming a Manichae, a Manichaean, which he calls a great error, which it was. Through his whole life, through his, and in, in this part, he's con concerned chiefly with what a horrible person he was. He's talking about the evil life that he left. And he says, he thanks God for saving him from this evil life. And he thanks God for, among other things, he says, I thank you, God, for punishing me for my sins to turn me away from them. But less than I deserved. I deserved worse. Yes, you caused painful things to happen to me to drive me away from this evil life but it was a lot less painful than I deserved. And then he thanks God for, for Monica, praying for him and bringing him to hear Ambrose. And for giving him a new will and desire. He talks about, do you remember we talked uh, yesterday, we talked about um, his, his battle between his, desi his evil desires and the faith that was beginning due to the preaching that he heard from Ambrose. He talks about that in the book. All the things that we know about him that we talked about yesterday, or almost all of them, come from 
this book. He thanks God for his conversion. And for the new and better and happier life. that he now has. Now, this is not better in terms of um, of, of his, his, wor his life in this world, although he did say that is better. Uh, not, not that he was more prosperous. He was less prosperous. He had less money. You know, this, he's not talking in terms of people you'll hear these days who say, God wants you to have your best life now, which is nonsense. That's not what Augustine is saying. But now he's living a life that he knows is pleasing to God. He knows he's not tormented by his evil desires. And now he knows he's going to have eternal life and he's thanking God for that. From there, he goes on to Again, still in the form of a prayer of thanksgiving. Uh, to examine not only his own life, but the life of every Christian. In terms of the temptations we face. He prays for better understanding of the scriptures. And then he goes on to glorify God for his kindness and goodness shown in creation. in the physical gifts he gives us. And in revealing himself to us in the revelation of the Trinity. And finally, praise for eternal rest. And that's the end of that book. So this is his book about God's work in the life of the Christian. Um, thanking God for his work in Augustine's own life. The City of God is, so here's a personal history of God's work. The City of God is about, is about the work of God in the city of the world. So we have an individual history of salvation, and now we have a collective history of salvation. I'm going to say God's work in nations because that's primarily what he talks about. Or in kingdoms. Which do I want? I'll use nations. Now this was a response to pagans who when um, especially following the Goths attack on Rome we talked about that quite a while ago but you should remember it the uh, Eastern Empire there were Goths wanting to come into the Eastern Empire and they said oh yeah you can come in 
go over to the western part of the emperor uh, of the empire and they'll give you land and then the officials in the west said no we won't so the goths rightly feeling cheated uh started making a giant mess not the best way to uh, to uh, respond to being cheated but that's what they did and one of the things they did was to loot the city of rome and the pagans said This is because of the Christians. They said, you stopped the worship of the gods. This happened because the gods are angry, because we didn't worship them. Because you Christians abolished their worship. Well, because you So this starts out as Augustine saying, no, it's not our fault. And no, this isn't ha happening because your fake gods are angry. He said, let's see, where do I want to start on this? Augustine said, let's see, I'll draw a box around this. To make it less confusing. He said, there have always been disasters. Even before we stopped the worship of your fake gods and your gods didn't help you when there were disasters. We can look at histories by pagan Roman historians and see that the gods didn't help Rome. And because of the worship of your gods, you suffered the greatest disaster. Which is corruption of morals and of vices of the soul. He said, the, em the empire, I'm gonna put this over to have more space. He said, the empire lasted a long time, not because the gods were happy, but because the real God was setting it up. He said, the real God was setting it up so that Christianity could spread. And God determines when nations rise and fall. It is really hard to write in print all this time. He said part of this was because the early Romans were virtuous. And virtuous people usually can accomplish more, not always. Then he goes on to say, Okay, not only did your gods not protect your empire, but your gods did, don't give you eternal life. Even pagans, I'm gonna give this guy a beard because he's a philosopher. Even pagan philosophers 
can look at your Zeus and say, puny god. Even your pagan philosophers say that your gods aren't real and don't save you. They don't give eternal life. They don't save your empire. They're, they're worthless and you know it. Your own pagan authors can tell you this. You don't even need to ask Christians. So no, it's not the fault of Christians that all these things happened. And if the empire is coming to an end, it's just because God determines the time the nations last and this one has come to his end. And besides, the Roman empire has been pretty evil for a long time. And even with the Christian emperors, you all haven't cleaned up your act very much. So if it's anyone's fault, it's yours for, for uh, refusing to repent. And this is just punishment for your sins. So then he changes the subject and he says there are two cities in the world from the creation to the end. There is the city of God and the city of man. This is where the book gets its title. Both are founded on love. But the city of God is founded on love of God. And the city of man is founded on love of self. And he said, these two cities, I drew a line here, but he said, these two cities in this life are mixed together. That is, they're not earthly nations. Well, sort of. They're not nations in the sense of having different kings and different borders. You can't find them on a map. The city of God is mixed in with the city of man and kingdoms, earthly kingdoms, are over here in the city of man. All of them. Including the Roman Empire. The city of God is the church. The church exists mixed into earthly kingdoms, but it's a separate city. And he traces the history of the city of man attacking the city of God from creation to the end of the world. He starts with Cain and Abel, and he goes through all the patriarchs, all the um, David and Solomon, Moses, Pharaoh being representing the kingdom of the city of man, Moses, the city of God. And all the nations that attack the Israelites, he goes through all the history of the persecution of the church up to that point and saying this is all the city of man trying to destroy the city of God. So they're going on side by side and even mixed in with each other all through the history of the world. But what's the end going to be? In the end, the city of man is going to fall. And 
to the city of God. is going to remain. In fact, even when the whole world is destroyed, the city of God, the church, remains in the new heavens and the new earth in the resurrection of the body. So remember, this has happened right, he's writing this right after Rome was besieged, taken, and looted by the Goths. They didn't keep it, but they besieged it, took it, and looted it. They did some pretty nasty things to the people there. But he's, he said, Rome is over here. Even though we have Christian emperors now, Rome is still in the city of man. It's an earthly kingdom, and its time has come to an end. Yes, bad things are happening. Yes, you are suffering. But Rome is not the church. A lot of people have come to think of the Roman Empire as the preserver of the church. The church goes on without Rome. The church goes on without any earthly kingdom. They all have their beginnings and ends, which God determines and the church will last forever beyond the end of the world to the resurrection in new heavens and new earth. Also, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, and I think I mentioned this when we talked about the gods of sacking Rome in the first place. He reminded the people of Rome, horrible things happen to you, yes, but they were a lot less horrible than they could have been. What if this army attacking the city had been pagans? Now they were Aryans, the Goths were Aryans mostly, but a lot of them, although their pastors and bishops were Aryans, a lot of them didn't really believe the Aryan heresies. A lot of them were probably Christians, probably not most, but some, and many of them protected the Christians in Rome from their pagan or more brutal Aryan, um, from their own comrades. They protected people from the, the soldiers in their own army. They weren't able to protect all of them. But he said, do you see that this is God protecting you even in calamities, even in the fall of an earthly kingdom? I said at the beginning of our previous lesson that Augustine was the last of the ancient church fathers. He died in AD 430. In AD 476, the last Western Roman emperor Romulus Augustulus was deposed by, I think he was a goth named Odoacer. That's a really bad crown and it looks Swedish, but whatever. And Odoacer did not call himself emperor. He did not claim to be a Western emperor. The Senate was still existed and the Senate sent to the Eastern emperor and said, hey, uh, come kick out these Goths because we don't have an emperor anymore and we, we're okay with you being the, whole, the emperor of the whole empire, come help us. And he said, nope, Odoacer is your king. Yes, I'm still the emperor and he's king under me, but he's still king, he's your king. Him. 
Odoacre didn't really care. He was king and the Western Empire was finished. So 46 years after Augustine died, came the end of the Roman Empire in the West. And as modern historians, we call this the end of ancient history and the beginning of medieval history. So again, you should now be able to answer my questions. What are Augustine's greatest books and what are they about? I do expect you to use up all seven of your lines of notes. If you need more lines, you may use more lines, but you may not use less. There is too much here to fit in just a few lines. So there's your history lesson.